So uh, welcome to the post-lunch session of the International Symposium on India's Biodiversity. We are of course here to commemorate Dr. Bhava's 80th birthday. And uh, I am Asmita Sengupta, a DHT Inspire faculty fellow at ITRI. I'm also the program officer of the Secretariat, which oversees the National Mission on Biodiversity and Human Wellbeing. And uh, I'm the one who's going to take you through the next series of talks. Now, while the last thematic session dealt with biogeography and the evolution of biodiversity, now we are going to delve deep into global change and conservation of biodiversity. We have an extremely impressive lineup of speakers for this session. So we are going to start with Dr. Uttam Sreshta, who is going to talk about the drivers of change in the Himalayas. I would like Dr. Uttam Sreshta to please come up on stage. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and I'm so privileged to work with Professor Baba as his graduate student. And I'm one of the last cohort of his graduate students at UMB, University of Massachusetts, Boston. Honestly, while making today's uh, slides, I really had a problem to putting things together. Uh, because as you know, Professor Bhava has a diverse interest. If you see his bio, and then you will find he has interest in land use change, climate change, evolutionary biology, institutions, sustainability, you name it. So to work with him is a challenge uh, because he has so many ideas he want to test and so many interests. And to survive in his lab as a graduate student, you have to do so many things. And I did uh, so many things and tried to put together, but luckily last year, uh, yeah, last year, as Dr. Mathur said, uh, IBES, the Intergovernmental Science and Policy Platform uh, for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, published a landmark report on the state of global biodiversity and ecosystem services. That report, which is almost 1800 pages long, uh, I had an opportunity to contribute to that report as a lead author and fellow that has outlined direct and indirect drivers of biodiversity change. And that made my life easier. And <clears throat> the indirect drivers that outlined by IBES was the demographic and sociocultural change, economic, technological institutions and governance. And the direct drivers are land use change, direct exploitation, climate change, pollution, invasive species, and other natural processes such as volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis. So in today's talk, I'll be talking about these dri direct drivers uh, namely, uh, for land use change, direct exploitation, climate change, invasive and alien species. The first one is about uh, land use change. Uh, as you have seen in previous talk, most of the examples were came from uh, Western Ghats, one of the biodiversity hotspots in this region. And today's, uh, in my talk, I'll be talking more about the examples from the Himalayan region. So the first one is about the land use change. And this is the work that we have done in Nepal. What we have done is we analyze spatial and temporal pattern of forest cover change in Nepal from 2001 to 2016. And we also uh, explore the socioeconomic factors such as poverty, population density, human development index, migration, and fuel load collections, and also the policy response. Uh, for example, the community forestry program, which is regarded as one of the most successful natural resource management program in Nepal, uh, responsible for the forest cover change in Nepal. Uh, despite the interventions like community forestry program for 30 years, Nepal still, <clears throat> there is a still deforestation going on and the forest loss is greater than the forest gain in Nepal uh, in that period. 
So there are several drivers uh, for this forest loss. And we looked at uh, these drivers at a district level because we have the data availability at the district level. And what we found was the district with larger number of community forests had minimum loss in forest cover. And the district with the higher proportion of the vegetation covered by community forests has maximum gain in forest cover. So after accounting all these socioeconomic drivers, uh, what we found was the community forestry program in Nepal uh, played a critical role in reducing deforestation as well as increasing forest cover in Nepal. So this is the first study uh, we conducted in a large or national scale uh, to show the effectiveness of uh, the one of the major interventions in, um, in our uh, country. Uh, so the next uh, is about uh, direct exploitations. I know many of you have seen this picture. Um, and it's, this picture was in uh, Kamal and Sunday's book, I think page number 186 in the Himalaya book. And <laughs> caterpillar fungus, you can see the caterpillar fungus in natural habitat. And this is the caterpillar fungus after uprooting it. So this caterpillar fungus is unique uh, biological commodity. It has three unique features. Uh, the first is life cycle itself. It is a combination of the fungus stroma and mummified caterpillar. And it also uh, is an endemic species which occurs higher up than 3,500 meter, uh, mainly in the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, namely three countries, China, India, Bhutan, and Nepal. And this species has another extraordinary feature. It is perhaps one of the most expensive natural commodity in the world. And I checked uh, the price of this fungus um, three days ago in eBay, and what I found was the price of this fungus is as double as the price of the metal gold, the most expensive, perhaps, uh, the um, metal in, in this planet. So it is more expensive than the gold. And because it has uh, various uh, medicinal uses, and it is widely used as a tonic, and it is also known as Himalayan Viagra. So I don't have to tell the, what is it used for. So, so <coughs> this. Uh, Spaces is collected by thousands of people in this region. And we looked at the price uh, at the local market in Nepal and other places. And what we found was uh, over the 13 year period uh, from 2001 to 2019, the buying price at local market has increased by up to 2,800 percentage. And the selling price has also increased by uh, 2,000 uh, percent in that period. So this exponential growth in market price um, that has led uh, oh, okay, that has led um, this direct exploitations, and you can see thousands of people uh, gathering there in this landscape to collect the caterpillar fungus. And we estimated in Nepal that every year around 300,000 people go to this alpine pasture, camp there, and collect this uh, caterpillar fungus. And it has a cost, of course. So this, because of this excessive pressure uh, of this collection that has led the decline in the population and the harvest, of caterpillar fungus, and we looked at the yearly, uh, you know, the number of caterpillar fungus harvested by the uh, the people there, and we found, you know, a steady decline from 2006, and we continue that study in other places, um, and even in uh, uh, Nandagiri region of India, and we found that it's a widespread decline uh, uh, of this uh, species in this region, and so, and that. Apart from the decline of this caterpillar fungus itself, there is a, another cause, that is uh, the deforestation of this uh, alpine uh, or, or 
uh, the mountain vegetations uh, or mountain forest uh, because most of the harvesters, they go to collect the caterpillar fungus. They use this fuel wood uh, for heating and cooking. And there, as I said, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of people go there from May to July for a short period of time and they, they burn all this uh, wood. And there is also uh, the huge impact on the, this mountain rangeland above the tree line. So <clears throat> this is the case of caterpillar fungus. And the next one is uh, the climate change in the Himalayas. And um, we simply ask, it's a, a very simple uh, kind of work that we did and get published. And it's, we simply ask, you know, what is the magnitude of climate change, particularly looking at the different uh, temperature and precipitation pattern uh, in the Himalayas? And what does it mean to the phenology uh, of uh, the landscape? So we looked at by using the satellite data uh, observed from 1982 to 2006. Uh, what we found was the, the region, the Himalayan region has warmed up. Yeah, so Himalayan region has warmed up by 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, that is in that period, you know, three times higher than that of the global average. And the, the precipitation uh, regime in that uh, Himalayan hotspot has also changed and it has increased by uh, 6.5 uh, 2 millimeter per year. And that has effect on the phenology that we look to uh, parameters by using this satellite uh, data like the start of the season when the uh, there is a the greening starts and then the end of the season that greening start senation. So what we found was that the start of the season has significantly advanced across the landscape by 4.7 days during the 25 years period from 1982 to 2006. And so these are the work that I have done when I was a graduate student at UMass Boston. And, and, and this work um, I did after I graduated from UMass Boston. And um, here, what we have done is we predicted uh, the climatically suitable niches of 24 species out of 26 reported invasive alien plants of Nepal. And many of you have talked about the biodiversity hotspot, but here we use a similar approach to find the change in invasion hotspot in Nepal. Uh, and what we found was uh, that the climate change will increase the climatically suitable uh, regions or uh, the, both the extent and intensity of invasive alien plants in Nepal. Uh, and that will have a negative impacts uh, on livelihood, uh, local biodiversity, ecosystem services, as well as economy. And as you know, Nepal is already a um, vulnerable country uh, because of this uh, uh, invasion, bi uh, biological invasion. So, and we, the, the case that I just showed, these are from Nepal. And in South Asia, we not only share the geography and culture, but also share the similar environmental and socioeconomic issues. We have uh, poverty, we have uh, pollution, we have so many things to get uh, common. And so, <clears throat> but we are terribly failed to work together. And if you look at, we looked at the total number of publications published by Sark Nation together, what we found out of 1.2 million publication published by South Asian nations, um, we only published 1.3% together. So not only there is a gap in the collaboration between us, but also there is a gap in the knowledge production globally. And we, we looked at you know, the, the knowledge gaps and identified more than 700 individual knowledge gaps uh, uh, found in seven IBIS report. And this gap has been persisted there since the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And, and we cannot achieve the goals like SDGs and IT biodiversity target without meeting uh, or without addressing these knowledge gaps. And Professor Bawa, has always been working, uh, advocating two things, I think. 
One is he has been advocating the importance of knowledge institutions, innovative knowledge institutions. Another thing is the partnership. And, and to fill that gap, he established um, Asoka Trust, a tree uh, here in India, and it inspires uh, us and all of us and many peoples around the world. And he created such a finest uh, institutions. But in Nepal, we don't have any institutions or good institutions like that. So <coughs> in my PhD defense, uh, Richard was, uh, yeah, Richard just one, uh, gave me a book and uh, with a message, you know, Uttam, you have come a long way and you have many adventures. The basically he was saying, you know, keep Dr. Baba in my mind as a role model to giving back my country. So that inspired me a lot. And after six years uh, of my graduations, finally, we founded one institution in Nepal called the Global Institute for Interdisciplinary Studies. And as you know, Professor Baba is, has incredible capacity to manage jet lag, but I don't have that capacity. That's why I quit my job in Australia and to move Nepal permanently to work in, in these institutions. And I'm happy to work here together. Thank you.